It's Johnny. They're all gonna laugh at you. They're all gonna laugh at you. Get away from her, you bitch. We all go a little mad sometimes. Haven't you? Let's face it, baby, these days, you gotta have a sequel. You fly back to school now, little Stein. Hello and welcome back to another episode of Once Upon a Nightmare where I chat all things horror. It's a new year and I hope you all had an amazing 2023 and it ended on a high. But it's time to get back to it and chat some horror. I am your host Lorraine Purden and this week I am going back 10 years, 2013, with spoilers. This is The Evil Dead. from that book. Something evil. This thing is attached to me as soul. <laughs> You're gonna have to kill her. You are all going to die tonight. Say what a great movie this was. I absolutely loved it. I have covered the original that was released in 1981 and that was episode 54. And while this film is the same, it's also very different and I am here for it. The original was a lot less serious, I found. And this one, oh my God, so much blood. And for some reason, I really liked that. I also recently watched Evil Dead Rise and what is the budget for the blood in these types of movies? I mean, there's so much of it. I mean, I love it. I don't know why, but recently I'm just enjoying movies with excessive amounts of blood. And, you know, we definitely get that here. Apparently about 70,000 gallons of blood was used and 50,000 of them was for the end scene. Apparently this was the most blood used in a film the end scene. It has a lot of blood. The original was said to use up to 300 gallons, so that will give you an idea of how much was used for this. As so much blood was used, they decided to film 95% of the film in chronological order, because as you can imagine, you're using that much blood, the scenes are going to get messy, so probably the thought of cleaning that up after every shoot would have been a nightmare and just not worth it. I mean, you could bring Dexter in to help, but let's face it, it's a lot of work. When a movie is revisited, this can bring some resistance. We all know that, whether it be from the hardcore fans or the original filmmakers. Sam Raimi, who wrote and directed the original, was on board, but apparently Bruce Campbell, who is the guy you also associate with the franchise, he wasn't that happy. But after he heard that there wasn't going to be an ash in this one, 
he he didn't mind because they didn't want them to kind of like recreate what he did. And because it was a whole new set of characters, he was like, go for it. And while he's not in this one, he kind of is. Well, only for a split second, it's kind of cool. So just watch it to the end of the credits. But he does produce it along with the original producers, Sam Raimi and Robert Tappert. So in the end, he was okay. No one plays Ash but him. That's the way he looks at it. And I get it. I really do. He's done a lot with that character and it's kind of his. Well, it is his. And to be fair, when you put your heart and soul into something, I can see how you would be a bit territorial about it. This version was directed by Fede Alvarez. He would also be one of the writers, along with Rodo Sayogus. Sorry, but should it? I know. And also Sam Raimi, because it's based on his story. This installment goes back to the cabin that we do see in the original. Five friends head to the cabin for the intent of having a nice holiday. But the real reason is they are trying to get Mia, who is played by Jane Levy, off drugs. This doesn't go well, of course, and the trip goes from bad to worse for her and for her friends and for her brother, who is David, played by Shiloh Fernandez. We also have Natalie, played by Elizabeth Blackmore, Olivia, played by Jessica Lucas, and Eric, played by Lou Taylor Pookie. I'm probably saying all these names wrong. And they find the Book of the Dead, and then the pesky demons are summoned to cause havoc. The Evil Dead franchise is a hot favourite to many, and it wasn't really mine, but I'm very interested in it more lately, and I really want to explore it. I've seen the first two, this one obviously, Evil Dead Rise, and I need to re-watch Army of Darkness, and take some time to actually watch Ash vs. Evil Dead, the TV series which stars Ray Santiago and Dana DeLorenzo. Uh, they were actually at the For the Love of Horror last year, the one I went to in Manchester, and they were actually really quite fun to listen to on stage. I always find it interesting when you listen to someone that you're not really that familiar with and you enjoy kind of what they're saying. So it makes me want to go and watch stuff that they've been in. And I do have to say, Dana seemed like a lot of fun and I'd say she'd be a good laugh to go out on the piss with. So uh, if you're ever in, in Rang Bath, then uh, give us a shout. Evil Dead 1 and 2 and Army of Darkness are part of the Evil Dead trilogy. And I only realized today that there's actually a musical, a musical. I had a wee listen and I'll take the films over the musical. I do like my musicals, but I like them to be Rogers and Hammersmith. Of course, I like The Wizard of Oz and um, I'm partial to the bit of the old uh, Greatest Showman. And uh, I do love The Court Jester. Anyway, back to the blood. We pretty much get into it from the start where we see this girl has been taken over by a demon. What I find so sad by all this is how the demons, it toys with the people. So we see this throughout when it tries to plead with the others. It almost makes it look like I'm still in here. You know, the, the person's been taking over and it's doing all these crazy things that is just not them. But then the demon's able to go, oh, but I'm sorry, daddy, and all this kind of stuff. And this is what we have here. We've got this daughter who's speaking to her father why are you doing this to me? It's me, it's me. And he's got her tied up and he sets her on fire. She is gone. He knows this, but it must be a really hard thing to do because you hear your daughter's voice. You can see your daughter talking to you, but you're like, I have to kind of separate. So I find those bits quite sad. So the group turns up to the cabin and like the original, it's not in the best state. It's not as bad as the original, but they do clean it up and it looks a lot better. The original was shot in Tennessee, so they went abroad for this one because it was obviously cheaper to Auckland, New Zealand. The exterior was shot in the woodland forest near Murawi Beach. God, my pronunciation is desperate. And the interior was shot in an office space. I'll be honest, I was surprised to hear it was shot in an actual forest as I thought it looked like a bit of a set. So I got that one wrong. The first night for the gang is tough as Mia has withdrawals. Uh, and But what she does do is foreshadow. So despite the fact that she's the one we see as not being of sound mind as she detoxes, she's actually the one who can tell something is off when no one else can. And they think it's just a side effect to what is happening to her, which I get telling her she's sensitive. She's extra sensitive. But the dog also finds something too, the one they've brought along, and he can smell something too. So from the start, I find I'm rooting for Mia. When it comes to the other characters, I like David and Olivia a bit. Natalie at the start for me is a bit of a non-character. 
Eric is so unlikable and he's the one that goes snooping, gets the book and unleashes hell. The worst thing is when they get the book, Eric knew it wasn't to be messed with. He went ahead with it anyway. And when the book's closed tight with this barbed wire, you know, kind of making it difficult to open, you know, maybe don't open it. It also looks like it's been made by Leatherface. Er uh, Eric, there are big red letters there telling you to leave it alone. And here you go, acting the Egypt, reading it out loud, dropping your blood on it. There's always an Eric. There's always one. So when Mia is outside, she sees someone. I really feel for Mia as I can, I can see her frustration. She is torn between this withdrawal, but also believing she's seeing something. So it's probably hard to distinguish between the two. I mean, I've never taken drugs like this, so I don't know, can you? But I get why they're doing what they're doing. But I can, and I can see why they think she's just losing it. Yes, drugs play a big part, but there is also something going on. So Mia's like, I want to get out of here. No one's helping her. And she crashes the car. And this is bad enough, but she's in the middle of nowhere. And there's this swamp thing. And that in itself is really scary. The set and it's all misty and gray. And she manages to run. But whether, you know, you were seeing this or not, you know, these things coming at you, this girl that she keeps seeing, this whole thing would be terrifying. And of course, what comes next is that tree scene. And it's pretty brutal. And the way she's like, dangling from the branches and the way they're grabbing her. She's very trapped. She can't go anywhere. And I do hate the way we see this other girl with this weird snake-like shape comes from her mouth and it kind of then, the branch thing then goes up between her legs or is that the thing actually that come out of her mouth? And then the way the branches kind of hold her legs apart, it's disgusting. And the fear on her face is it, it tells it all. And there's that moment where there's no sound as this, this thing is happening to her, as it's going inside of her. And that is kind of like the brutal shock of what is happening to her. I mean, overall, I felt like this scene was a lot more terrifying than, than the original. But what annoys me next is when... Olivia won't take her back to the hospital. So she's come back and she's obviously in a state because of what's happened to her. Now I get, you know, what happened? Oh, a tree did this. Okay. She's a nurse. Olivia's a nurse. And she's basically, you know, she's getting the same treatment here than she would in a hospital. But I feel like with Olivia, it's more of a control thing. You know, Mia just sounds like she's losing her mind. But, you know, the irony, she's the only one aware. But with Olivia, I feel like she's, well, we've been here before. You know, I know what I'm doing. I'm a nurse. And it just felt very like, you know, the way sometimes you meet people and they're more interested in being right than what is right. And I feel like this is what Olivia is like when in that particular scene. What Mia is seeing is a demon known as the taker of souls. And when it appears to Mia, it does so in the form of this human girl. She's wearing a white dress and the Taker of Souls is a demon who can turn people into deadites. And the deadites in this one are, they're a lot less comical. There was almost, I think, in the original when the people turned into them was this mischievousness, like this naughtiness, like a bit of a child. And here, I don't feel like they're like that at all. They also like to harm themselves as well as others. And they just come, I, I didn't find the ones in the original scary, more gross. Whereas here, I find them rather scary. So we see the change in our first victim, who is Mia, and she's been taken over and we see her hurting herself in the form of scolding herself in the shower. And the brother's like, okay, enough. We need to take her to a hospital. And of course, the bridge is down. The road is flooded, can't go anywhere. So now we have the classic turning on each other. And the main one in the fire in line is Olivia, because she is the one that was like, we need to keep her here. And this stage, though, Mia is fully gone. She's fully turned into demon and she comes out with a gun, shoots her brother and attacks Olivia. And in this scene, she vomits some really thick kind of substance over Olivia. And Jane Levy said herself that um, when filming it, she was like, at one point, I vomit all over somebody. A lot of vomit, like a shit ton of fluid. There really is. I had this tube practically down my throat and I'm on top of this girl and vomiting all over her. When you actually do something like that, I don't think I can actually describe the sensation. But I actually went to the corner and cried. I'm really sensitive. 
but I felt like I was drowning my friend Jessica. It felt so bad I was shaking. And of course, it's not actual vomit, but I just know that, you know, when I was actually watching this, I thought a lot of it was CGI, but um, apparently they did, you know, a lot of this movie was actual practical effects. Practically all of it was um, practical effects, which I'm extremely impressed by. But that scene... I can imagine because obviously with the Evil Dead films, they go really over the top with the blood and with the vomit and with the cutting and all this kind of stuff. It's very extreme. And while the girls know that they're only acting, it's probably sometimes quite a hard thing to do. So I kind of get why she feels like that and had to take herself off for a wee moment. So the next one to be possessed is Olivia. And it hits quite quickly after she's attacked by Mia. So it doesn't take that long before the change actually happens. So when people are going crazy, it's like, let's just give them a shot. But Eric is like the first one to say, you know, you can't take this away with medicine. It's not going to do anything for them. This is something bigger. This is something to do with the book. And after Olivia has changed, like the way she acts, she starts cutting her mouth off. Um, It's so brutal. And then she turns on Eric and he's stabbed in the eye with the syringe and then he's battering her and you know I told you about all the gallons of blood and this is where we really start seeing it um at first but the group after this attack on Eric from Olivia and Olivia doing what she did to herself they're really starting to deteriorate one by one and you know every sound puts you on edge as you're waiting to see what's going to happen next who is going to be next The cabin is not lit the best. And for a small place, there's one thing I find about this, which is probably adds to the scare of it. For a small place, there are a lot of doors. There are a lot of doors, a lot of places to kind of burst out of, for these demons to burst out of. And, you know, you're not safe because we sometimes see it going through the woods and it just busts the door open. So it's not like they ever really have anywhere to hide. And while this movie is different from the original, and if you're reported, they they didn't actually like this movie because of how different it was. I think it's a good thing because of the difference. What made the original great is the fact that it was an original film. For someone to simply come along and copycat it would be a waste of time, like a quick grab for the nostal- nostalgia of it and the nostalgic bank balance. Um, making money for the sake of it, basically. But Alvarez, I find, has managed to keep the story, but give it like this bold take. And I thought Bruce Campbell, he was right in saying that he didn't want to be in it and to not have a new young Ash um, in the movie. I think that was the right choice. So I think with this, the difference makes it good because I am not a fan of copycat remakes. I just don't see the point in them. I really don't. So what is happening it did happen in the origin in the original. It's just a different spin on it. As we saw at the beginning, and we will now see with Mia, you know, they they are bringing in the twisted side to the demon, not the obvious evil things, but the ability to pull on the heartstrings of friends. Like Natalie is being tricked by Mia to come down to the basement. So we see that basement scene that we do see in the original, and Mia is pleading with her, but her face is away. And she's like laying on the guilt, the normal. How can you do this to me? And because it sounds like Mia, you can't blame Natalie because it's like just in case, just like we saw at the beginning of the film with the father and daughter. But the issue with the deadites is the people involved have no idea, no idea what they are capable of. So you can forgive them for, you know, when they see the friend as herself pleading for help, they go to her. Unfortunately, though, this is the worst thing they can do. It's so sadistic. I feel so sorry for Natalie here, as she can't really see Mia's face, but unfortunately, another one bites the dust. When Natalie wakes up on the stairs, we see Mia come out of the dark towards her, and you can feel the paralysis of fear within Natalie as Mia is coming towards her. And I think that was kind of one of the most disturbing scenes for me because Natalie's like, trapped on the stairs she's scared she thought she was helping her friend but her friend is this thing and it's coming towards her I mean this movie personally I thought it was a roller coaster you know and just when you think you get a second it pulls you right back into the horror of this cabin I don't feel like this film ever really lets up and then we can see that obviously Natalie has turned not straight away but she starts with her hand Uh, Natalie is quite quiet so when she speaks up 
the shit really hits the fan as she amputates her arm when it gets infected. And of course, Mia's like, don't do it, don't do it. This must have been a nod to The Evil Dead 2 when Ash cuts his hand off with a chainsaw when it becomes possessed. And David, bless him, and he's so hopeful. He just keeps thinking it's going to be okay, it's going to be okay, because he doesn't want to, you know, just quickly rush to kind of kill people. I think he believes that this can be sorted, and I get that these are his friends and his sister, so it's really hard to kind of be like, yeah, just kill them all, you know. But Eric is such a dick here, and he doesn't seem to get how hard this is for David. He's basically telling him, we need to murder your sister. Yes, I know she's a demon, but still, you can't expect him to be off. Sure, no problem. And then he has the audacity to call him a coward. Like, for fuck's sake, Eric, like, just give the guy a second to process what you're asking him to do, what you're telling him that needs to be done. I get why you're saying it, and I get kind of the urgency with it, because, like, let's face it, this all happens quite quickly, but... Just, just give him a moment. Just give him a moment. And don't call him a coward. I thought that was real shit. I did not like Eric at all. So Natalie is on the loose with this nail gun. She's changed. And the way she plows this thing into Eric, she's battering him with a crowbar. I mean, Eric, <laughs> he's an asshole, but he didn't deserve this. He really takes the biggest beating. And those nail guns, that, and they're big nails and the way they fly into him, like the state of Natalie, she has no hands. No hands, yeah, because I think the other one gets shot off. She's um, got nails in her own head. I mean, this film just gets more brutal as it goes on. But, you know, I was so here for it. But the last 25 minutes or so, I really enjoyed the brother and the sister battle at night because you can see at the beginning that they kind of have a relationship. There was an issue with her mother, but they, their mother, but they kind of have this relationship where it's it's not great. And she feels that he's not really there for her. And because he won't go running off and bringing her home before she turns, she still thinks he's not there for her. But while that's all going on, Eric gets stabbed again. I mean, you can't go a minute without Eric getting penetrated in some form. <laughs> but alas, poor Eric, we knew him well and he finally succumbs to his injuries. He's got stamina, though. I'll give him that because the pounding that lad took, he should not have lasted as long as he did. But maybe he's still alive. So David, it's now all on you. And at the start, you feel like he's actually going to, you know, listen to Eric and kill his sister. But what he actually does is he buries her and then he performs this ritual, but not before that pesky demon pretends Mia's in distress. Oh, help me, help me. It's not going to work, demon. Not today. David has had enough. I have to say, though, this demon's laying it on really thick. And when not getting its own way, mother hates you, you know, and she waits for you in hell. <laughs> but now we have some like MacGyver shit going on here as David kind of makes this defibrillator thing. So he wants to bury his sister, bring her back to life, because he's thinking, that obviously, that that, you know, if he kills her and then brings her back, then the demon's technically gone. And this scene is quite sad, though, and even gives us, you know, the sad music that we know as he says, come back to me, Mia, because why he's doing this, unfortunately, the battery dies. And we really feel bad for him here as his sister, as, you know, she has turned back. So obviously, when you see the deadites, their faces change, they get very ugly and kind of pussy and gross looking and all this kind of stuff. And when she dies, she goes back to her former self and... It's kind of, if not the only time, it's the only time in the movie where we get a bit of a, get a bit of um, a calm, quiet scene. You know, you feel for a moment you have peace and we get an amazing moment when she comes to and it's all worked out. But, you know, Eric being the twat he is has to go and ruin it all and come back as a deadite and stab David. And, oh God, you know, I, I like to have an ending. I like to have an ending where I've rooted for someone and they've they've survived. But we don't get that here. I wanted David and, David and Mia to like leave off together. I didn't get my ending. I really wanted it. And bloody Eric ruins everything. He started this, then he, then he ruined it all. So David sacrificed himself. And we see all throughout how David is viewed. Like he never really listened. He was called a coward. He, you know, Mia didn't believe he cared for her. She feels he's not there for her. But at the end of the day, 
he always was. Like, if it wasn't for him and he listened to Eric, he would have just killed her. But he stuck with his belief and felt that he could save her. And he did. And he gave his life for it. And I suppose as well with the ending of this film, Mia becomes somewhat of a final girl. You know, she really, we really get this uh, bit at the end where, you know, David's gone into the house, it's blown up. We do get a really great shot and it's of Mia standing in front of the house, looking at the house and it's on fire. Brilliant shot. But the demon girl, where's she gone? She's come back. And there's like this epic final girl fight at the end to save Mia, to save herself from this demon girl. And we've got the blood. I mean, it's raining down. This is where all the budget went. <laughs> and, you know, I was re-watching it to um, have another look at it just to see what was going on because sometimes I do forget bits. And I'd forgotten about the bit where she traps her arm under the car and how she just has to get herself away. And the way she rips her arm off, like, I mean, I don't know if I could do that, but obviously I've never been in the situation. And the blood is coming down and she's trying to get away from this demon. And she finally is there with her chainsaw, her one hand. Um, and this girl was only 23 when she filmed this. And how she blooming really holds it all together. I thought she was exceptional casting. I think Lily James was up for the role, but couldn't do it for some reason. But this girl was just, I thought she was brilliant. I loved her. I hated her rooting for her she, action girl final girl you know she really held it together but I think at the end when this demon's kind of crawling towards her and the because her feet have been chopped off as you do but the way she just that chainsaw the way that chainsaw just cuts this demon in half this bitch just falls flops from one side to the other two halves and the blood is just coming down everywhere and it was just brilliant. But then it just stops. And I suppose that's the next bit of peace we get as we see it's come to an end. And all the others have died. And she just gets to walk off. And there's this beam of sun coming through the woods as she walks off and coming through the trees and she walks to safety. And I just really liked that. I mean, I thought this was a really good film and I know I kind of went through it here really quickly, but I just really enjoyed it. I suppose that's like you can tell how much I really like a film because I kind of get a bit like, you know, so I, I know I need to slow down my speech, but I just thought this film was really, really good. And I really want to cover, cover Evil Dead Rise. Um, but yeah, I would highly recommend this film. I really enjoyed it, as you can probably tell. But that was my little take on Evil Dead. And uh, as always, thank you for listening. And don't forget to rate and review on Apple, Spotify or Podchaser. I'm actually uh, only audio on um, YouTube. So you can go over there and listen as well if that's where you like to listen. Um, obviously, you're not. You're listening here. For updates, reviews and behind the scenes, you can find me on Instagram as Once Upon a Nightmare Podcast, Facebook as Once Upon a Nightmare, or you can email me as Once Upon a Nightmare Pod at gmail.com. As always, thanks for listening. Stay safe and I will chat to you soon. Bye.